I want to tell you about a story about a little girl, and her name is Linda. Now, Linda grew up, um, she was born in America, but when she was very small, her parents went to, as missionaries to Africa. Um, they, they served there in Zambia. And so Linda spent many, many years there in Africa. And especially that part of Africa, you just, it's just summer all year round. It's just degrees of heat. So you get some, part, some parts of the year are hotter than others. So that was all that Linda knew. And then when she was about 12 years old, her parents went back to America and they settled in Tennessee. That's where my brother lives. And there in the winters, it got so cold. So free, oh, she'd never felt so cold in all her life. And um, the school that she went to, she made a nice friend. Her name was Elizabeth Ann. And there, we don't have it here, but then the schools, they have like water fountains. Have you ever seen a water fountain? You press a button, and then this water bursts out of this pipe. And so the children at break time would go drink from this water fountain. Now Elizabeth, because it was very cold, and she said to, uh, to Linda, do not put your tongue to the pipe because it will burn. And Linda thought, how can something cold make you burn? It's only hot things that make you burn. How can something cold make you burn? So this one day she went to the water fountain and Elizabeth wasn't with her and she was drinking and there were nice little icicles around it. And, um, and so she stuck her tongue out to, you know, try and grab some of these icicles and her tongue got stuck to the pipe. And, um, you know, can, can you, if your tongue is stuck to something, can you scream for help? No, you can't really do much. Just open, pray, please, somebody come, come, come and help me. So Elizabeth saw very quickly what had happened. And so she ran there inside the school. She got a glass of warm water and she threw it over the pipe. And then Elizabeth's tongue came away. But you know what Elizabeth learned? Her tongue burnt. It was so sore for quite a few days. She could hardly eat. Any time she ate or drank something, it burnt. You know, especially if she found if she ate some tomatoes or something. It, her tongue was really, really sore. And you know what, Eliz you know what Linda learned from that? To listen to people. When people warn us about something, if we don't listen, we actually are gonna just hurt ourselves. And you know, that's why God has given us his word, is to give us messages of warning. Don't do this, because if you do it, you are going to be hurt. And so, you know, that's a lesson for all of us, that we need to learn to listen to one another, listen to your mommy and daddy, um, listen to your family, listen to your friends. Don't think that you know everything. You remember the story. God bless you. I have a wonderful Sabbath day. It's good to be with you again all this morning, friends, and to share with you from God's word. Um, also good to see um, some of our members who we haven't seen in church since COVID began. We're back again and we praise God that we're slowly returning back to normal. Our scripture reading is taken from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. A very well-known portion of scripture. 
Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Gracious Father, we pray that your Spirit will speak to our hearts this morning. Draw us closer to you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this is the third sermon in our series on renewal and the Holy Spirit. We noted in our first presentation an article in Christianity Today where one of the great Protestant Christian leaders stated that the greatest problem facing the Christian church as a whole today is somnambulism, sleepwalking. In a recent survey conducted by the General Conference, it was found that only 49% of Adventists study their Bible and pray every day. And if you think that's bad, in a recent survey just last year, 2021, we found that only 11% of American Christians read their Bible and pray every day. And if you go to Europe, the situation is even more bleak. In the UK, for example, only 4% of Christians read their Bible and pray every day. And 66% of those who call themselves Christians, have no connection with the church whatsoever. We saw that the parable of the ten virgins teaches us that spiritual preparation cannot be bought or borrowed from another person at the last minute. Our relationship with God must be our own, and it must be now. The five foolish maidens had not fully yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit. They had an intellectual knowledge of the truth, but they were not spirit-filled. What is more, the five wise virgins were not being selfish in not sharing their oil with the other five. Character, you see, cannot be shared with someone else. One Christian cannot do for another what he must do for himself in preparation for the crisis that lies ahead. All ten of the maidens fell asleep. But when the midnight cry was given, there was an energy crisis and panic ensued. It struck suddenly and without warning, they had been caught off guard and unprepared. Friends, when my petrol tank is near empty, I make sure that I fill up. I don't pass by the petrol station when the light on my petrol gauge is flashing. Now, one of the ways I ensure that I have an adequate supply of oil and that my tank remains full is through regular personal communion with God. And last time, we saw that prayer is absolutely vital to the Christian life. Without a vibrant prayer life, we die spiritually. We also saw that a lack of prayer actually limits the power of of God in our lives. In the book of Acts, it was humble, earnest prayer and repentance that brought unity amongst those early disciples. And God responded by filling them with His Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit energized them with zeal and divine power, enabling those initial 120 disciples to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and for the early, Test the early New Testament church to experience explosive growth. Why do we need an infilling of the Holy Spirit? Because we leak, said Dwight L. Moody. We are like a rain tank, he said, that has sprung a leak. Living in a sinful world, all of us are constantly leaking, and we're in danger of running dry. Like that tank, we need refilling. As with the early disciples, the key to renewal, both personal and corporate, and the key to an infilling of the Holy Spirit is anchored in prayer. The history of the Christian church reveals that every single great revival was saturated in sincere, earnest prayer. Two selected messages, page 121, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. And last time, we looked at the great Welsh revival at the beginning of the 19th century, just over 100 years ago. There we saw how the sincere prayers um, of young people, and especially Evan Roberts, influenced the lives of of others, and how the other young people caught the sparks of revival. And it's interesting, it began with the youth. I find that very significant. How they confessed their sins of anger, bitterness, and resentment, and how the Holy Spirit was poured out in a powerful and a most unusual way. From this humble beginning, God began to move throughout Wales. Those young people fanned out to other churches. Other people experienced the flames of revival. And within just six months, there were 100,000 converts in Wales. Soccer matches had to be postponed because people were in church praying. Many bars and taverns shut down. People flocked to churches and places of prayer for spiritual renewal. Rough, cursing coal miners would come to the services and would go back changed men, different men, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So much so that even their pit ponies could not understand them anymore because they were speaking a new language. They weren't swearing at the animals anymore. The history of the Christian church, friends, reveals a very simple formula. Where there is little prayer, there is little power. But when Christians open their hearts to God in prayer, He pours out His Spirit in a most remarkable way. During those ten days in the upper room, the disciples' prayers were not formal or ritualistic. Their prayers were sincere and they were earnest. Could it be that we don't have that same level of spirituality and firepower that those early disciples had? You see, friends, we live in an age where we trust human genius. There are committees and individuals with advanced degrees who attempt to solve problems. If you have a medical problem, you see a specialist physician. If we have a financial problem, we see a financial advisor. If there's a family problem, we see a family therapist. For every problem, we tend to rely on man. And, he, and God is pushed into the background. Now, I don't mean to imply that these professionals can't help. Of course they do help. For God uses their gifts to help us. 
But when you live in a society that is bathed in secularism, without even realizing it, that mindset infiltrates your life, and you tend to look on human methods to solve all of life's problems. The early church did not have all the gadgetry, all the professionalism that we have today. What they had was just raw dependence upon God. And they really needed that because they were just a small handful of people going up against tremendous odds, including persecution. In answer to sincere, earnest prayer, we see phenomenal growth taking place in the early church. In the first part of Acts, we have only the 120 disciples. And then in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were baptized. In Acts 4, there were 4,000 baptized. And when you come to the middle of the book of Acts, we begin to see cross-cultural growth. You have Cornelius and his family and the Ethiopian treasurer who took the message back to his own country and gave rise to the whole Coptic church. The Holy Spirit is moving powerfully amongst people of other races, creeds, and nations. New churches are being planted. New continents are being reached with the gospel. And by the end of the book of Acts, just 40 years later, historians tell us that there were more than one million Christians in the Roman Empire. What the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts, dear friends, is truly amazing. And you say, Pastor, I really wish that I could have that kind of experience, um, a revival in my own prayer life. But to be 100% honest with you, um, when I get on my knees and pray, it feels sometimes as if my prayers go up to the ceiling and bounce straight back again. You know, I think of my own prayer life, it's weak. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes I fall asleep while I'm praying. How can I experience revival in my own prayer life. Well, friends, let's be practical. Let's be hands-on this morning. Let's explore a few practical suggestions of how to revive your personal prayer life. Firstly, try to visualize. You know, normally when we communicate with someone, we look at them. Or we visualize them when we're speaking to them on the phone. Not so. But how do you visualize God the Father? How do you visualize the Holy Spirit? It's very difficult, isn't it? But we can visualize Jesus when we pray. Try and see him. Look into his face. And pray to Him. It will help you to remain focused. Secondly, what can we learn from the vibrant prayer life of Jesus Himself? Well, according to Scripture, Jesus made time alone with His Heavenly Father His very first priority. Jesus found it necessary to withdraw from the hustle and bustle of the crowds that surrounded him day by day. He had to turn aside from a life of ceaseless activity and contact with human needs to seek a quiet place of uninterrupted communion with his Father. Like us, he was completely dependent upon God. And in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength. Communion with his Father was where he found comfort and joy, spiritual strength and power. And his life is our example. Yesterday's experience is not good enough for today, folks. 
We need a fresh experience with Jesus every day. God will not necessarily provide something in the worship service to get us through another week. You know, some Christians have that kind of attitude. Let me go to church so that I can be filled up. Preacher, you feed me. No, no, no. Time with Jesus every day is what gets us through the week. As the bumper sticker says, seven days without Jesus makes one week. Those who do not breathe or eat will die. And no one can breathe or eat for another. Now, there are three things that I would like us to notice about the prayer life of Jesus himself. And prepare yourself for some surprises. We begin in Mark 1, verse 35. Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So Jesus had a specific time, a, a regular time to pray. Do you have a regular specific time set aside for communion with your Father? A time when your heart is open to God. A time when you are seeking His face. For some, that may be, like Jesus, early in the morning. For others, it may be mid-morning. There are young mothers who are awake much of the night with their newly borns. And so while their baby is napping, mid-morning they spend time, intimate time, with God. Others, again, are night owls. Their brain functions best in the evening or a bit later at night. For others, their most intimate time with God is as they take a daily walk in nature. Some of my most memorable and intimate times with God have been out in a forest or on a secluded beach as the sun was setting over the sea. As I talk with God and listen, I hear his voice on each and every breeze. It is in such moments, friends, that God impresses our minds and speaks to our hearts. Jesus had a specific time to pray. We too need to discipline ourselves by setting aside a special, regular time for prayer. Secondly, Mark 1.35 says, He went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus had a special place for prayer. He often went to Gethsemane and there knelt before his Father in prayer. Do you have a special place where you allow God to speak to your heart. A fueling station where your heart is spiritually renewed. For me personally, I have two places. My first place for prayer is my study. There I have an old lazy boy chair where I go and kneel to seek my God in prayer. It's become a very special place for me. Another place I pray is at a special place out in nature or out on a special trail. Get out alone. Listen to the songs of the birds. And if you're walking at night, look up at the stars and speak to your Creator. Just as Jacob went to a specific place Bethel, to meet with God. Just as Jesus went to Gethsemane to pray. So find a regular time 
in a special solitary place to pray. Thirdly, when you examine the prayers of Jesus, you will discover that they were always audible. His prayers were verbal. He prayed out aloud. Let's go to Matthew 26. Jesus and his disciples were in the garden of Gethsemane. Verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face pray, and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Notice it doesn't say that he fell on his face thinking. No, he fell on his face saying. And then when you drop down to verse 42 and verse 44, we read, And he went away a, a second time and prayed, saying. Verse 44, So he left them went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So Jesus vocalized his prayers. He prayed out loud. I find that rather remarkable and highly significant. If you want the most meaning, meaningful prayer life possible, learn to pray out loud. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, when Jesus uh, had ceased praying, the disciples came to him and they said, Lord, please teach us to pray like that. In other words, they actually heard him praying, praying out loud. And they, they had never heard prayers like that before. And so they asked him to teach them to pray. And then in Luke 11, Jesus proceeds to teach them the Lord's Prayer. Jesus models a vibrant prayer life. He had a regular time to pray, a special place to pray, and he prayed out loud, pouring his heart out to his Father. Why is praying out loud so significant? Well, has your mind ever wondered why you pray? Mine certainly has. You're on your knees, and while you're praying, you're thinking about the bills that have to be paid. You're thinking about the supper that has to be prepared for the family. Um, you're thinking about the car that needs pre uh, repairs. And pretty soon, three minutes have gone by, and you think to yourself, man, I better get my mind and on back on track again. Friends, if we are really honest with ourselves, we'll admit that it happens quite regularly. Please don't misunderstand me. There's a time for silent prayer. Prayer within your own mind. You're driving with some friends and you send a little prayer up to God. Silent prayer. Um, you're at work. And you send a little prayer up to God. Quiet prayer. You don't pray loud at work. But what I'm saying is this. When you're alone with God, in your, uh, in your very own special place, if you want the most intimate experience with God, pour out your heart to Him audibly. Vocalize your words. Speak to Him as if you're speaking to a friend. Why? Because it takes more effort from your brain. It takes greater powers of concentration to formulate your words and your mind will wonder less. I have definitely found this to be true in my own experience. And so I'd like to encourage you to try praying out loud. It will absolutely revitalize your prayer life with God. I remember a young lady in East London who said, she came to me and she said that she was falling asleep during her prayers. And so I said, have you tried praying out aloud. And she said, no, won't the devil hear me? You need to try it, I said. It will make a phenomenal difference in your prayer life. And so she did. And uh, she came back to me later and said, wow, I now have so much greater focus. I'm staying awake. I'm, 
I'm, I'm putting more immersion and expression into my prayers. This lady experienced a revival in her relationship with Jesus and in her prayer life. But you may be thinking, as that woman was, Pastor, I don't, I don't want the devil to know what I'm praying. He can't hear my thoughts, but he certainly can hear what I'm saying. Friends, my answer to you is really quite simple. Don't worry about that at all. You see, the very last place the devil wants to be is near a Christian when they are praying. In fact, in the book In Heavenly Places, page uh, 256, we read, The devil trembles and flees before the weakest soul who is on their knees finding refuge in the mighty name of God. Satan and his demons have no power over a soul who is in communion with God. Because out of our own freedom, you see, you have personally chosen to speak to your maker. It is the very last place the demons want to be. What is more, God surrounds you with a legion of his angels when you pray. As happened with Daniel when he was praying in uh, Daniel chapter 10, for example. There we find that Michael, Michael, the one who is like God, came down and he beat back the forces of evil, says the scripture. Although the devil is able to send his demons to surround us, they show their heels when we are in God's presence and in intimate communion with him. God sends his holy angels to beat back the forces of evil. And so, friends, we don't have to worry about the devil hearing our prayers. We are sheltered by the angels of God. And that's a wonderfully comforting thought, isn't it? So pray out loud, knowing that Jesus is by your side and that the angels of heaven are holding back the forces of evil. Once again, our high calling, page 130. Learn to pray Aloud, where only God can hear you. Another way in which we can renew our prayer life is to do what is called scriptural praying. This is where you meditate on and talk to God about a passage of scripture that you've just read and that has impressed you. Let's just take an example, a simple example. Nahum 1 verse 7. Let's say you're reading through the book of Nahum and you come across verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. As you think and meditate on that verse, pray over that verse. Lord, I thank you that you're a good God. You have no evil intentions. I thank you, Lord, that you are indeed a refuge in, time of, in a time of trouble. Lord, you know what I'm going through in my life at the moment. The troubles, the challenges that I'm facing. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you're my refuge. Lord, thank you that you're a caring God, that you care for those who trust in you. Lord, I'm placing my trust in you right now. I know you're going to help me through. You see, that's scriptural praying. You're praying over that scripture, and you're personalizing it. And friends, you can do that with almost any scripture in the Bible. I encourage you to try scriptural praying. I guarantee it will revitalize your prayer life. And you won't be praying the same things over and over again. Because every scripture is different. Finally, there's another way in which we can renew our prayer life with God. And this one I think most of you know about. And that is by using what we call the ACTS model. Now, most people 
view God as a kind of big father Christmas or Santa Claus. You know, and they come to him with their long shopping list of requests. Lord, I've got this problem. Lord, help me with this. Lord, I need that. It's a shopping list. But when you use the Acts model, we don't begin with our shopping list. That's for last. Instead, we begin with adoration and praise. A in Acts stands for adoration and praise. Now, if you want some help to know what you can praise God for, there's so many things we can praise and adore Him for. But go to Psalm 145, Write this down and try it. Psalm 145 or Psalm 86. In Psalm 145 alone, there are 17 characteristics mentioned about the character of God. His goodness, His love, His faithfulness, His justice, you name it. It's all there. There's so many reasons for praising God. Secondly, C stands for confession. Every day we disappoint God. Confession brings peace to our hearts. It reestablishes that connection with God that sometimes we build up through our ignorance or through our sin. T stands for thanksgiving. Spend a bit of time thanking God. And there's so much that we can thank God for, friends. As someone said, count your blessings one by one. You may be going through a hard time, but I want to tell you, you're not alone. There are millions of people in the world going through that same experience right now. And most of those are in a worse situation than you are. Count your blessings. So I start with adoration and praise. I then confess my sins. And then I thank God for the many things that he has done in my life. And then finally, S stands for supplication. Humbly bringing our requests to God. Smeak bearders in Afrikaans. Presenting my needs and my requests to God. And interceding on the behalf of others. Using the Acts model will also revitalize your prayer life. Finally, what was the purpose of revival and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts? Well, the ultimate purpose, dear friends, was soul winning, witnessing, Church growth, church planting. It's all about growing the kingdom of God. And that's why God desires to pour out His Spirit upon His church. Revival is not about me jumping up and down, falling to the ground, being slain in the Spirit, as some Christians refer to it as, or experiencing electricity running up and down my spine. Friends, that's emotionalism. It's a false revival. No, true revival is not inwardly focused. It's not about me. It's outwardly focused. Nor is it that I pray for revival and reformation in my life so that I can point out what brother or sister so-and-so is doing wrong. That's not the purpose. Rather, I seek God so that I can have a pure heart, so that there will be nothing that blocks or hinders the flow of the Holy Spirit into my life. The Holy Spirit, as it were, unplugs the pipes so that He can flow in. So that I, in turn, am able to serve others, to witness to the world, and lead others to Christ. Acts 1 verse 8. We read it for our scripture reading. Jesus said you will receive power. Dunamos. Dynamite. 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. There it is. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The task God has given us is seemingly impossible, folks. Just as it was for that early church. There are still nearly two billion people on our planet that don't know about Jesus. That is why we need personal renewal and why we need to pray for an infilling of the Holy Spirit to empower us to serve Him more effectively and to share His love with a dying world. False revivals are based on emotionalism. They are superficial in nature and very egocentric. They focus on what God is doing for me. It's all about me. Rather than what God is calling me to do for Him and for others. Genuine Holy Spirit revival leads us into a deep experience with God. Our desire is to know Him better and His will for our lives. Genuine revival is bathed in prayer, rooted in God's Word, anxious to know God's will and to follow God's truth and to share that in a witness to the world. Dear friend, prayer is the key to revival and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need to humbly seek God's face and earnestly pray for personal and corporate renewal so that our tanks can be full. Has your prayer life become dull and monotonous? Do you feel as if you're just going through the motions? Are you sensing that the Holy Spirit wants to do far more with your life than you can possibly imagine? If so, I would like to encourage you to pray earnestly and ask God to fill you. And try some of these practical suggestions. I gave seven this morning. Practical suggestions. So that you may experience renewal in your own personal prayer life. May God help us in that. Amen. Oh yes, dear Jesus, we need the showers of blessing. Many of us here feel that our tanks are running dry. Yet we see what is happening in the world all around us. This world is slowly imploding. Yet, Lord, you give us hope. And that hope is in Jesus Christ and his coming. Father, help us to share the good news with others. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Forgive us for our indifference and apathy at times. May you renew our hearts. Renew our prayer life, Lord. Because we know that prayer is the breath of the soul. And now may the blessing of God go with each one. May his spirit lead and guide you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.